Good morning, Miss Fulton. My name is Stephanie. I'll be your nurse today. Before we get started today, I'd like to verify your name and date of birth, please. It's April Fulton. My birth date is 6680. Excellent. And do you have any allergies that I should be aware of? No. Okay. While you're verifying name and date of birth and allergies, it's important to verify this with either a paper chart or the electronic medical record. Ideally, you may have looked over the chart before coming into the patient room to see why they're here before you begin your physical assessment. So I'd like to explain the physical assessment to you and what it is. It doesn't necessarily constitute a physician's order to do something like that. It's part of the nursing care that we provide. And the reason that we provide it is because we want to know if all of your body systems are functioning normally, to verify or investigate if you have any pain or any alterations in any of those bodily functions, and to gather data for your provider to tailor your care. There are two types of assessments that we do most often in the hospital or in nursing care, and one is the comprehensive assessment and the other is the focused physical assessment. The difference between the two is that a comprehensive includes every body system starting from your head to your feet, whereas a focused physical assessment is maybe one system or more and typically occurs in between comprehensive physical assessments or after a procedure, before surgery, or after a surgical procedure. Before, before we begin the physical assessment, I would like to ask if there are any areas that are hurting you or if you have any pain anywhere today. Just in my right wrist. Okay. Do you have any questions about the physical assessment? No. Okay. It will involve uncovering certain parts of your body as I go along, but I will do my best to maintain modesty as is important for patient care. And if at any point you feel any pain when I'm touching or palpating an area, please let me know and I will stop. Okay. The first thing that I'm looking at is I'm looking at the general appearance, what we also call the general survey. How is the patient's hygiene, grooming, self-care, affect, meaning behavior, and posture. Earlier you and I took a walk to the bathroom and I noticed your gait was very steady, so I'm confident that that is intact. Mm -hmm. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you if you're in a comfortable position at the moment. Yes. Okay. I am going to elevate the bed up to a comfortable height for myself to eliminate any unnecessary bending. And then I'm also going to grab some clean gloves. I'll begin at your head, and what I'm looking at initially, I'm inspecting just by standing here and looking at the scalp to see if there are any obvious lesions or breaks in the skin. I'm going to palpate or touch and inspect at the same time the hair, moving it away from the ears to look behind the ears to see if there are any breaks in the skin there as well. Could you turn your head to the left, please? Thank you. And I see that when she turns her head that she has some good range of motion in her neck and she's able to not only uh, turn her head but she's also able to follow my command which tells me a lot about her orientation as well. Could you turn your head back to the center please? Thank you. Could you look toward me? Thank you. And I'm going to look at the other side of her head as well behind the ear. And if you could turn your head to the center and then put your chin down towards your chest and then I'm going to inspect the back. Excellent, and if you could put your head up for me, please. Thank you. The next part that I'm going to do is I'm going to have you do a few pieces of what's called the neurologic assessment. And that entails me uh, using a pen light to shine it into your eyes. So when I shine the pen light in your eyes, the best thing you can do is keep your head as still as possible, and I'll give you some instructions on how to follow the pen. The first thing I'm going to do is place my hand on the bridge of your nose and then on your forehead. And the reason that I'm doing that is so I can look at one pupil at a time. And I'm looking at the pupils to see if the pupils are equal in size, if they are round, if they react to my pen light, and then I'll look and see if they accommodate as well. And I'll explain that as I go along. So I'll start with the first side, the left side here. If you could look straight ahead towards me. And I'm going to start out towards the ear or just beyond the ear and briefly bring in the light until I see the pupil react. It's not necessary to, to have the light shining into the patient's eye for an extended amount of time. Excellent. And I see that her pupils are equal and they are round, they react to light, and they are size 3 according to my gauge. Next for accommodation, what I would like for you to do is look away from me over to the corner of the room 
and then focus back on the pen light. Excellent. One more time, please. And focus on the pen light. Excellent. Now the next thing I'm going to do, also with the pen light, is I'm going to check uh, your six fields of gaze. And what that shows me is if your extraocular muscles are intact or you have no issues with any of those areas that are controlling eye movement in the brain. So the first thing I'd like you to do is start by staring at the pen. I'm gonna go out, up, down, up to the center, over, up, and down. There are two different ways to do six fields of gaze. The first that I did was the H pattern. The second that I'll do is the star pattern, and either are good to check whether or not those extraocular movements are intact. The second one will be up, down, diagonal to up to the right and down to the left, back to the center, diagonal to the left, down to the right, and back to the center. And I see that you aren't having any shaking or abnormal movements when you move your eyes from side to side and up and down. I would like to ask you a couple of questions before I move forward. Can you tell me where we are at this moment? We're at the Phoenix College Medical Center. Excellent. And can you tell me the date today? It's July 30th. And the year? 2018. Excellent. And can you tell me why you're here? I am here because I hurt my wrist. Okay. So I can see that by asking her those questions that she's oriented not only to herself, but to the place and the time and then the situation. So the next thing that I would like to do is ask you to smile. Helps if I smile too. And then if you could frown. Excellent. And I'd like to see if you could stick your tongue out, please, and open your mouth and say, ah. I'm going to shine the pen light in just to check the mucous membranes, and our mucous membranes are moist and intact and pink. I'm going to palpate down the neck and feel what's called your carotid arteries, and I'll do that one at a time because if I did it both at the same time, too much compression could make you feel lightheaded, okay? If you could just keep your neck nice and relaxed, and you can move your head center. Thank you. So I'm palpating down. I'm also noting the skin to make sure that the skin is intact on the neck and see if there are any issues there. I'm just gonna move your hair here. So I'm gonna start around the outside of the jaw and just lightly go until I feel both sides at once and then I'll remove one hand. Light pressure is all that's needed here and that's all that you want to do because you do not wanna slow down that pulse. And I'm comparing both sides as well as we will for the entire physical assessment. We're always comparing one side to the other. Okay, while I'm here at the neck and the upper shoulders, I'm gonna look and inspect the skin and then I'm going to palpate. Do you have any areas of pain? No. Okay, excellent. I'm gonna unsnap the gown here and look at your shoulder. No areas of pain at all there. And I'll continue on over to the other side, inspecting the shoulders. and looking again to see if there are any areas of pain. As I continue on down, I'm gonna go a little bit further just towards the center of the chest. Any pain here when I palpate? No. Okay. And the next thing that I'd like to do is I would like to listen to your heart and your anterior lung sounds. So how your lungs sound in the front of your body because they will sound a little different in the back of the body. You have your heart and you also have other organs such as your stomach that are very close that make different sounds. So it's important that we do both front and back. But I'll let you know when we're ready to move to the back. Okay, the first thing I would like to do, I'm gonna get one clean glove here, but I'd like to uh, clean my stethoscope. I've disposed of my trash after cleaning off my stethoscope, and now I'm going to listen to your, the anterior sounds in your chest, which are your heart and your lungs. The first point that I'm gonna to listen to, and I'm gonna slightly move your gown, is at the left sternal border, the second intercostal space is the aortic valve. Directly across on the left side of the chest, left sternal border, is the pulmonic valve. I'm gonna move down to the third intercostal space and listen to Herb's point. I'm gonna to continue to move down to the fourth intercostal space and listen to the tricuspid valve. 
And the last point that I'm going to listen to is what's called the mitral valve or the apex of the heart. And Ms. Fulton, I'm gonna take the back of my hand and place it on the tissue and slightly move it away so I can hear the best sounds. This is where the apical pulse can be taken and this is also known as the point of maximal impulse. I'm gonna move on to the breath sounds, and it's best to do these assessments of the chest sounds, heart and lungs, under the gown, meaning skin to stethoscope, because the gown itself can create what's called a lot of artifact or different sounds. I'd like to have you take a deep breath in, please. Excellent, and I'm gonna to go to the opposite side because we're always comparing side to side. One more time, deep breath. Excellent, and I'm gonna move back to the right side Deep breath in, excellent. And I'm gonna move back to the left side. Deep breath in, excellent. And I moved out slightly because the heart sounds are so close in here that if I kept going down with my stethoscope, I may get more heart sounds than lung sounds. But the lungs go outward, much like the chest. And so if you move out slightly, you can get a little bit clearer sound in terms of the lung sound. Ms. Fulton, I'm going to have you sit forward for me, please. Okay, if you could lean slightly forward more. I'm inspecting the posterior thorax, and what I'm looking for is, again, any lesions or breaks in the skin. I'm looking to see that the spine is straight. I'm also looking to see that when she moves her chest on a breath, just a normal breath, that her chest wall movement is symmetric, meaning that both sides move similarly at the same time. What I'm also looking, if you could sit up nice and straight for me, I'm also looking for what's called the anterior to posterior ratio. That anterior to posterior ratio means that the diameter of the side or lateral part of the chest is half as big as the diameter of the posterior chest or the anterior chest. And that ratio should be a normal two, one to two. Now I'm gonna to listen to some breath sounds on the back, Ms. Fulton, and I'll instruct you to take some slow deep breaths. The first one will be high up on this side of the chest. Deep breath in and out, excellent. And you wanna give the patient some time with this. Don't rush through this because if you have them taking too many deep breaths too fast, they'll hyperventilate. Deep breath in. So you want to give them some time to reset in between each breath. Deep breath on this side. Excellent. There are a couple of ways that you can do the posterior thorax breath sounds. Deep breath in. A comparison is always the key. Deep breath in. And moving down and slightly outward will also help to be able to hear those sounds. Deep breath in. Excellent. Are you doing okay, Ms. Fulton? Mm -hmm. And one more deep breath on this side. Excellent. And if you keep your arms forward but sit up nice and straight for me, I'm just going to reach out over here and listen to the lateral breath sound towards the base of the lungs and towards the side. Deep breath in. And on this side. Excellent, you can relax back. Before we move on to the rest of the assessment, I wanna clarify a couple of points for the anterior and posterior sounds that you're looking for. For the heart sounds, you want to hear the lub-dub at each of those points on the chest as you listen. And it's okay and recommended best practice to listen for a full minute for the apical pulse, specifically if you know that the patient might have a medication that affects the cardiovascular system. For the breath sounds, both anterior and posterior, you wanna hear a full inhalation and a full exhalation. That takes some time, so be patient as you listen to those sounds. That is the best thing you can do in gathering that data and information. As we move down, before I get to any of the other systems, I'm gonna inspect the upper extremities. So I'd like to unsnap your gown on both sides so that I can compare both sides of the arms. And then I will instruct you to do a few movements for me so that I can test range of motion. So I can see that the skin is intact on both sides. Any problems while I'm palpating or touching anywhere on the arms, okay? That hurts, that one. 
Okay, over here on this yes. side. Okay, so she mentioned that she has some pain, and if a patient mentions in any point that they have some pain, we don't want to just glance over that. We want to ask them some specifics about the pain, and we use a mnemonic in nursing that's called PQRST. The PQRST mnemonic that we use in nursing for identifying characteristics of pain includes P for precipitating factor. That means what makes the pain worse or what leads to the pain. Quality is the Q. How does the pain feel to the patient? Give me quality again. Q is quality. How does that feel to the patient? Have them describe to you what that pain feels like, sharp or dull. R is for radiating. Radiating meaning does the pain move anywhere else or is it just localized to the area where they stated they had pain. S is for severity if you were using a numeric pain scale, meaning to describe to the patient that zero is no pain and 10 is the worst pain they could imagine. Where does that pain fall on that rating? And T is for time. When did it start? While I'm down here at the wrists, I'm going to palpate what's called the radial artery. And I'm gonna compare both sides. And then I'm gonna move upwards to the brachial artery. And again, comparing both sides. What I'd like for you to do now is if you could extend your arms, being careful with your sore spot on your wrist, I'm gonna have you grip my fingers as hard as you can. Excellent. And then I'd like for you to bend your wrists, and we'll be careful with this side, bend them as much backwards towards your, your person or your body as much as you can. And if you could bend at the wrist here, that would backward hurts. towards you, okay. And if you could push me away, okay. More pain when you do that on this side? Okay, so we won't have you do that anymore. What I can see as well is that all of the skin is intact in the upper extremities and in the hands. What I'm going to do next is I'm gonna check for capillary refill. We typically use the nail bed and apply a small amount of nail bed pressure to see how fast those capillaries refill once the blood has been occluded for a moment. And a normal time frame would be three seconds. And so once you've pressed on the nail bed, you wanna watch and count and see how long it takes for that pink to return. Because she has nail polish on, you can use the pad of the finger instead, or you could use the pad of the thumb as well. And pressing with your finger on the pad of the thumb and waiting to see when the pink returns. Once you press, it will turn white as you occlude some of the capillary flow, and then it will become pink once the capillary flow returns. So that concludes our upper extremity assessment. And now, as I put the gown back together, I'm going to explain to the patient that I'd like to lay her down. Ms. Fulton, I'd like to lay you down to continue the rest of the assessment. And that is going to consist of your abdomen or GI system, gastrointestinal system, your bladder, and urinary system, or GU system as we call it, and then your lower extremities. Please lay your head back and let me know when you're at a comfortable position. Ideally, you would like the patient to be as extended as possible so that you can see everything you need to see and that you can hear what you need to hear. Is that comfortable for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's also good to let the patient know that at this point you're going to need to expose their abdomen so that you can inspect the skin. I'm going to pull the blanket back and pull the gown up a slight, slight bit here just so that I can get to the abdomen. Now, in the other areas of the body, we have palpated first, inspected, palpated, and then auscultated. On the abdomen, we reverse that order. We will auscultate first, then we will inspect and palpate. The reason for that is because if you palpate first, you could disrupt any of the normal gastric or gastrointestinal sounds that are currently occurring. I'm also going to take a look and divide the abdomen into what's called four quadrants. Visually, I'm gonna have a line going from the top of the sternum to the top of the pubic bone, vertically down the belly button, and then horizontally across the belly button from the top of the hip bone to the top of the hip bone on the other side. Then, basically what I have now is four different areas in which to listen. 
to listen to the abdomen, you first start at the lowest point or the right lower quadrant and you want to make sure that you're not too high. So you may need to move the waistband to listen to those sounds. Should you not hear any sounds within the first few seconds, you need to continue to listen until you do and keep an eye on the time just to be sure that if it's past 30 seconds, you may call those hypoactive. If you don't hear anything within the first 30 seconds or minute, you need to continue to listen until you do. And if you are ready to say that the bowel sounds are absent, you need to make sure you've listened to for a full five minutes. Once I'm finished with the right lower quadrant, I'm gonna to move to the right upper quadrant and do the same there. Then I'll move across to the left upper quadrant and repeat. And to the left lower quadrant and repeat. And I've inspected kind of as I did the um, auscultation, but I'm also just going to make sure that I look and see that there aren't any bulges or breaks in the skin. Then I'm going to instruct the patient that I'm going to press on the abdomen and at any point if there's pain, please let me know. And you just start from side to side pressing and you're pressing to make sure that it's soft, non-tender, that it is not distended. And then you wanna know by asking the patient what has been the quality of their nutrition and their bowel movements? Have you had a good appetite lately? Yes. Okay. And have you had any abnormal bowel movements in terms of diarrhea or constipation? Yeah. Okay. So once we've concluded that, we can make sure to replace the gown and maintain the modesty as we move down. So now I'm gonna start the bladder examination and the bladder is located in between the uh, right and left hip bone about midway, lower in the pubic area. And what I'm going to do is just press as I go along. Do you have any pain in this area? Okay. And some of the questions that you want to ask the patient include, Miss um, Fulton, did you have have you had any burning with urination lately? No. Okay. Have you had any urgency, meaning that you need to go but can't? No. Have you had any frequency going frequently, even in small amounts? No. Okay. Any discoloration in your urine? and any malodor or bad odor to the urine. Excellent. The final portion of our physical assessment is gonna include the legs, and so I'm gonna pull the blanket up to expose the legs and lower extremities. And the first thing that I'd like to ask you to do is to see if you can bend your knees and place both of your feet flat on the bed. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking for range of motion. She has good hip flexion, knee flexion, and ankle flexion. You can extend your legs back out for me. I'm looking for swelling in any of the joints as I move down. I'm looking for color. I'm also looking for hair growth. The first point that I want to palpate on the legs is I want to palpate the popliteal pulse, which is behind the knee. And again, I'm doing both sides at the same time to compare. Then I'm going to move down, and as I move down, I'm also palpating to see if there's any pain in the lower extremities. I'm looking for symmetry in the calves, and I'm also looking for symmetry or any abnormal hair growth. As I'm assessing the lower extremities, I'm gonna go down all the way to behind the ankle until I can feel the posterior tibial pulse. And again, comparing both sides at the same time. Mrs. Fulton, have you had any pain in your legs or joints at all, lower extremity joints? Have you had any swelling or what we call edema that you've noticed? No. So I'm gently palpating the skin and I'm pressing right across that shin bone or tibia to see whether or not there's any swelling. And if I don't see any pitting or where my finger indentation stays, then I can say that, they, that you're free of what's called edema or swelling in the lower extremities. As I move down, I'm looking at the feet, and the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to, have to ask you to lift your right heel so I can look underneath. I'm pressing to see, again, if we have that good capillary refill and that there's no break in skin integrity. I'm gonna do the same to the other side, again, comparing as well, checking to make sure that we have good capillary refill. There's no redness or break in skin integrity. I'm looking at the top of the feet for the same to see if there's any breaks in skin integrity, if there are any lesions or any sores. The next thing that I'm going to do 
is start right in between the big toe and the second toe with three pads of my fingers and follow that down looking for that dorsalis pedis pulse which is about midway to the ankle. Should you not be able to feel this upon palpation, you can always get a what's called a Doppler machine where you can find it and hear it audibly. But this is an important pulse to be sure that you locate accurately. The last part that I would like to do is to check the capillary refill of the toes. And because of the polish on the toenails, rather than doing the toenail pressure, I'm going to do the tip of the toe skin pressure. And I'm looking for that re-blanching or that, that blood flow back once I press or occlude the capillaries. Ms. Fulton, could you press against my hands like you're pressing on a gas pedal, please? I'm checking not only for range of motion, but for strength in lower extremity. And could you pull your toes toward your nose? Pull as hard as you can against my hands. Excellent. Any problems when doing that movement? No. Excellent. So that concludes our physical assessment for the patient, but there are a few final things that I would like to detail for you. I'm going to make sure that she's comfortable by pulling down the blanket again. I'm going to ask her if she has any questions. Ms. Fulton, do you have any questions about the physical assessment that we completed? No. Okay. Are you comfortable in this position? Yes. The last thing that I want to make sure that you note is that we have some safety basics that so you always want to leave the patient in the safest position possible. And what that means is that both upper side rails need to be up and locked. The bed needs to be down in the lowest position. And the patient's bedside table needs to be in the position that's comfortable for them. And their call light needs to be within reach. This is your call light, Mrs. Fulton. Oh, I can attach it here to your sheet so that you know where to find it. Okay, thank you. And that concludes our physical assessment.